So we've seen that the box counting dimension is defined by this relationship, where here's the dimension D, this is the number of boxes of side S, and C is some constant independent of S. And in order to use this, we have to let the um, box size S get really small. So um, there's some problems with this though, which is that um, S usually can't get really, really small. And there are a number of ways to see this. So for the Koch curve, I started with boxes like this and counted, or you, you did on the last quiz actually. And then you can let the boxes get smaller and um, smaller still and smaller still. Um, at some point, counting them individually with your fingers becomes um, far too tedious, but we could get a computer to do it for us. But even then, um, there's gonna be some limit. We can represent the um, Koch curve mathematically to arbitrary precision, but at some point our computer is going to run out of memory. There's going to be so many boxes. The number of boxes we need grows exponentially. So that imposes a limit on things. If we had um, a photograph of a coastline, or here's a map, we could zoom in on the photograph, but eventually, 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 excuse me, we run out of pixels. Um, so we can't make this to, you know, a real photograph. We can't blow up to arbitrary resolution. Eventually you lose um, resolution. And certainly, if we had a fractal like this from my elderberry bush, we can't zoom in here forever because, um, and use smaller and smaller boxes, because eventually the self-similarity stops. I can zoom in a few times, but eventually what I'm left with is just gonna look like um, a, a single branch. The self-similarity doesn't go on forever. It's the same thing with a coastline. As I zoom in, I might see bumps on top of bumps on top of bumps, but eventually, um, I could zoom in a long time, but eventually I'll start to see um, individual rock structures, maybe even individual molecules if I zoom in enough. So the self-similarity doesn't go on forever. So what this means is we can't push this limit um, as s goes to zero infinitely far, both because it requires too much computing memory and because real fractals don't scale forever. They're fractals only over um, a range of length scales. So what are we gonna do? Well, there's a pretty standard procedure for doing this. And um, I'm gonna illustrate, talk about how the procedure works here, and then we'll do a couple examples. So this might be a tiny bit abstract. Bear with it. Once you see an example in the next video, um, I think it'll make more sense. All right, so what do we do? Well, let's start with this equation. And I'm gonna do like we did before. I'm gonna take the logarithm of both sides, apply log properties, and this equation becomes this. Log n of s equals d log one over s plus log c. I went through the steps, the algebraic steps, to get from here to here in one of the previous videos, so I, uh, there's no need to do it again. Um, you can go back and look in that video if you want. I'm going to do one other little thing, which is use a property of logarithms. And maybe I'll just sort of do that here as a, um, keep it out of the way. So log one over s, well that's the same thing as log to the minus one. One over s is, log, is um, s to the minus one. So that's properties of exponents. And then we can use the exponent property for logs to write this as minus log s. So I'm gonna replace log one over s with minus log s. So then this is gonna become log of n of s equals minus d log s plus log c. And this equation may not look much better than this. In fact, it may look worse depending on your feelings about logs. But I claim that this is actually a really useful formula. 
And the reason that this is so useful is that this is actually a linear equation. This is the equation for a line. It's sort of deep in disguise, but equation for a line is y equals mx plus b. So this uh, relates x and y. m is the slope of the line, and b is the intercept. So that would look like this. Let's see here. So B is the y-intercept, where the line crosses the y-axis. And M is the slope. Which is change in y over change in x. All right. So uh, why do I claim this is useful? So here's what we can do. We can take some s and n of s measurements, like we've been doing throughout this subunit. Then we can take their logarithms. And if we plot them, if we plot the logs of those pairs of numbers, we should see a straight line behavior. We can then um, figure out the slope of the line. And the slope of the line will be minus d. If we wanted to, we could figure out the intercept, and that would be log c, if we needed to know that as well. So this gives us a way of seeing what happens in a nice picture. We can do a little bit of geometry with it as s gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we can see if we're seeing um, linear behavior like this. So um, what I want to do next is illustrate this process for a square, where this will work out really nice. And then we'll illustrate this for some fractal or some other shape. And we'll see um, some of the subtleties associated with the fact that s can't go um, to 0 exactly.